But I've got two speakers, so I've got Tim Shrek Chowdhury, who is Vice Chair and Interim Executive Director of BRAC, and Dr. Abbas Bria, who is Deputy Executive Director of the International Centre for Diagnosis and Diseases Research in Bangladesh. They're going to speak first, um, uh, and I think they're going to show a short video as well. And then we're going to have some short commentaries from Naomi Hussain, um, an IDS fellow who is currently guest in Japan. We're going to have Naomi um, just on the video link uh, on, online. Um, from Jerry Bloom, who is present in the room, uh, also an IDS fellow working uh, in health systems. Uh, and then from, uh, from Mel Newport, who's director of the Welcome, um, the new Welcome Centre at the Brighton um, Sussex uh, Medical School. And she's going to comment particularly on the research um, implications of, of, of this work. So I just want to start by um, introducing our two speakers in more detail. First, Dr. Mushtaq Chowdhury. He's Vice Chair and Interim Executive Director of RAC Bangladesh and an expert in health poverty, innovation, and primary education. In his roles at RAC, he has helped the organisation play a central role in providing health, education, and micro finance services for poverty reduction um, and in achieving its status as one of the world's uh, largest non governmental organisations. He's a co founder of RAC University's James B. Grant School of Public Health and was his team for five years. Among his other distinguished roles in global health, he has worked for the Rockefeller Foundation as a senior advisor in Southeast Asia. He was a member of the UN Millennium uh, Project's Task Force for Child and Maternal Health, and he holds a professorial position at Columbia University. It is, however, the work of the BRAC to alleviate poverty and improve human development that he says drives his future ambitions. Dr. Travis Weir is the Deputy Executive Director of ICDLB International Centre for Diarrhea and Diseases Research in Bangladesh. He's the first Bangladeshi national to hold that position. He's a professor at the Brack University, James P. Grant School of Public Health, and an internationally reputed demographer and public health researcher. He's been with ICDLB since 1980 and is a major research leader in Bangladesh on population and health and development. He has many international research links and sits on numerous high level national and international committees. He's a member of the WHO Scientific Resource Group on Equity Analysis and Research, the Scientific Advisory Group of the Southeast Asian Community Observatory in Malaysia, and is the interim chair of the Board of the Commission on Health Research and Development in Geneva. He's also the founding chair of the Scientific Committee on Poverty and Development of the Asian Population Association, and many other um, roles uh, uh, distinguished from him. Um, so, thank you very much to Abbas and Mushtaq for being here. It's a great honour to have them here. Uh, we're going to pass the floor over to them. Uh, I've been asked to note that uh, as we're live streaming this, um, uh, it's also been tweeted live, um, and the hashtag is HD Bangladesh, for those who understand these things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, Mushtaq Abbas, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, and many friends in the audience, Larry, Jerry, Jack, and some others in the audience as well. A very good afternoon to you all. Mustak and me are here uh, to share with you the success of Bangladesh uh, in the health sector of Bangladesh, just triggered by the uh, recent series of violence. Uh, We feel it uh, extremely privileged to be here. We are grateful to Vanias and our friends uh, to end this and take this opportunity for us to, to share this uh, personal journey here in this regard through journals and other kind of things. Uh, the idea of Lancer series came almost like a surprise to us. Both Mosh and me are included 
depicting that Brazil group of uh, ancestries in Southeast Asia, two Bangladeshis and the And after a couple of meetings of the steering committee, you know, the Southeast Asia ancestries, we saw this struggle uh, the potential authors are facing in terms of deciding what story to tell. Eventually, they were uh, making progress uh, to tell the story. And we felt that it seems to me they don't have seems to us that they don't have much of a story to tell. In that regard, Bangladesh has a much better story to tell. Why can't we have a series on, on Bangladesh? And then we shared it with uh, Lancet, uh, it was, uh, uh, with support from Lincoln Chen, who was chair of the China Medical Board. Uh, Lancet agreed that it's a possibility to consider to have a series on Bangladesh. <coughs> Uh, you know, the real fun started after having the Lancet agreement <laughs> to, to choose topics, what to write, to identify authors, and to deliver the Lancet publishable articles, which goes to the review of review Lancet. So we started the process with a steering committee form, then we identified key authors, and then we had the repeated workshops to decide about what story to in the process, uh, I must have with uh, uh, Dr. Lincoln Chan and the role of Dr. Pagamadas, who is one of the editors in Lancet, was very helpful for us. It helped us to focus, learning down the learning down the process of the process. Very, 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 It was supported by a Rockefeller Foundation, a grant to us literally, and recognized that we were closely in partnership. Okay. As in the past, all this organization had a history for a long, starting from one of the education submission, taking knowledge to the villages. Uh, this time also, uh, we, we did pass. Uh, we produced this on time. Uh, which, which, as, you, as you are the best judge to tell the hard work of the stories of the previous time. There were uh, two or three times uh, which was published in the Nazir series. Some were uh, commentaries, uh, some communications, and then uh, some articles. There were six, chap six chapters. Uh, five of them were substantive, and the last one was a call to action, basically, recommendations. As you can see in the first slide here, I mean, the communication and commentaries, we had Sarah Refi Chabet, the founder of REC, to write a piece on. And then Professor Amat Hussain was one of them, so volunteered to write this. So it gave a huge weightage uh, in terms of what's being written in the series. In the, in the chapters, uh, nine chapters, uh, there are six in them. We have authors uh, both from the organization of Sen. Uh, and uh, as we see, the contents are very interesting. Of the contributors, we'll see. There are uh, 30 authors involved. Of the 35, 35 are accommodations. Uh, yes, the last year, are ex, uh, our colleagues from other countries who had interest in work experience in Bangladesh. So, we made a collective enterprise uh, to do our best. <coughs> it took three years. Uh, many uh, cities, country cities, and regional cities took three to seven years. And in some instances, uh, they divided the whole workshop crowd into multiple groups. For the process was not faulty and not inclusive. But for us, we are both very fortunate that uh, we succeeded that process and done it in a manner that uh, nobody felt excluded. And we did it in three years' time, in the, in the record time. The call to action, which I come and present here in the greater detail after most of the presentation, was endorsed by the senior uh, public health and development leadership. And internally, there has been a strong support from the national actors within the country. And as you can see, the announcing ceremony in Dhaka, uh, the president of the country was the chief guest. Uh, he is shown there as spe uh, speaking, uh, standing there. And we had the uh, minister, Sarah Chabad, and Richard Martin, who were who attended and encouraged us. So, with this, uh, I conclude the first section of it that I would like to invite Dr. Mushtaq to 
to share with you this afternoon finding from the from the whole series. Privilege for me to be to be here today at, at IDS, uh, University of Sussex, um, uh, and it's particularly uh, eventful for me because, because I'm meeting so many friends, old friends here, uh, and also new friends. Uh, so so it's, it's a real uh, big occasion for me. Uh, we're also happy that that we have the chair, uh, Hillary, who is an old friend of us, and we've been working together many for many years, many many years. And she's also an author. She's also an author. Of the course, of the course, of the Double privilege. Uh, 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 personally, also, I mean, I'm I'm grateful to Sussex because uh, both my children were edu educated. Uh, so um, uh, my son got his masters in uh, development economics, and my daughter got her uh, uh, undergraduate education here in, in, in the University of Sussex. So I I, I don't know if if uh, they are uh, they are observing. This through the through the through the web web past, but, but I'm sure, sure there will be uh, a thrill to to, uh, to know that I'm, I'm uh, here in, in, in uh, at the University of Sussex. Uh, well, uh, 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 I was talking about the, the 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 changes that that has happened and how we have we have tried to uh, document that through the lesser cities. Uh, you probably know that Bangladesh is one of the six countries in the world now uh, who are on track to achieve both the Millennium Development Goals 4 and 5. So that makes Bangladesh a very sort of uh, uh, unique uh, uh, situation. Uh, uh, so what, what I'm going to do now is really to provide you an overview uh, of, the, of, the, of the papers and the commentary that, uh, that have been covered by uh, the Lancet. Uh, and in doing that, uh, what, what I'm going to do is, is to talk uh, a uh, little bit about Bangladesh and then uh, present to you some of the miracles, uh, if you can call that, uh, which has been called by the, the editors of Lan uh, Lancet as one of the great mysteries of global health. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then I will sort of try to explain in, in our own way how is why we think that this is happening, the, 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 the explanation for that. Uh, <clears throat> this is the map of, of the region where Bangladesh is situated. And as you can see that the, the big small country in the, in the region is Bangladesh, which is surrounded on three sides by India. Uh, we have a small border with the Myanmar in the uh, southeast, and we have the Bay of Bengal uh, in the south. Uh, Bangladesh uh, is, is quite a big country, it's the eighth largest country in the world uh, with 153 million population. Uh, Bangladesh is a country uh, which is the most densely populated in the world, if you can ignore a country like uh, uh, Singapore, for example. So that makes uh, Bangladesh a, a huge potential also. How do we really use that huge resource, the human resource? Uh, if England at the same uh, density, for example, as Bangladesh, England, then you would have this, about the same population as, as Bangladesh because Bangladesh and England's land area is about the same. Uh, we got independence in 1971 after the war, uh, and uh, the war led to a lot of destruction. Uh, uh, the infrastructure were in ruin. Uh, and there were millions of refugees who uh, went to India, they were coming back. Uh, so so uh, many people at that time were pretty sort of uh, uh, skeptical about the viability of this small nation. And some very unkindly uh, considered or, or, or called us a basket case because they thought that uh, Bangladesh will uh, all the time will depend on external help. But 42 years now, uh, we see that we have, the country has turned around and there is a huge positive demand that is, that is going on now. Uh, 
this table shows uh, the uh, our development indicators and some of the health outcomes in Bangladesh in comparison to some of our neighbors. And the neighbors we have chosen here are Pakistan, Nepal, and India. And as you can see, that the, uh, in terms of GDP, for example, Bangladesh is poorest except uh, next to Nepal. Uh, but in terms of the proportion of the population in poverty, Bangladesh has the highest poverty rate, which is 32% compared to 31% uh, uh, in Nepal and, and much lesser in India and Pakistan. But if you uh, look at the, uh, the, uh, 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 the four columns on your right, for example, you see a huge uh, advantage for Bangladesh. Uh, in terms of female enrollment at the primary level, uh, Bangladesh has the highest enrollment rate, uh, which is 92.3% of the children are going to school. That's the net rate. Uh, in terms of life expectancy, Bangladesh also has the highest life expectancy uh, in the region, which is 68.3, compared to 65 in India, 65 in Nepal, and 65 in Pakistan. Interestingly, all these figures are about the same, same rate. But more, more uh, interesting about the life expectancy uh, is the gender difference. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 until the late 1980s, Bangladesh was one of the three countries in the world where women lived the shorter life. But now, this has been corrected and women now live two years more than men. So this is a huge achievement that, that the country has, has made. Uh, in terms of infant mortality, as you can see, the Bangladesh has the lowest infant mortality rate. Uh, and if we compare what, what was there when, when Bangladesh became independent, we had about 150 at the time we became independent, now it is only 42. Uh, uh, there has been substantial uh, decrease in maternal mortality rate, as you can see that uh, we have uh, 194 compared to uh, large numbers in our labor countries. Uh, this table shows uh, some of the health systems indicators and how uh, health outputs compared with the same uh, uh, same neighbors uh, that, that, that we have. Uh, here we see that uh, that the per capita uh, expenditure in health is the lowest in, uh, uh, in Bangladesh, which is only twenty-seven dollars, and uh, uh, two thirds of that actually are out of pocket. So, so the government spends very little uh, on, on that care. Uh, in terms of EPI which is the immunization rate. Uh, Bangladesh has one of the highest rates uh, in, the, uh, in the region, back to Nepal, which is 82%. And uh, if we go back uh, to the mid-80s, for example, Bangladesh had only 2% immunization rate. But the government wanted to uh, uh, change the situation to, to, uh, to really bring immunization to every, every child. So they invited the NGOs because they knew that they won't be able to do it themselves. So NGOs like RAC and KR and, and many others actually came forward to work on immunization. And within five years, uh, in 1990, the immunization rate went to 70%. So this was a huge kind of uh, moral boost for the country in the sense that this showed that if Bangladesh works, the change is possible. So that was a huge, 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 huge With respect to oral dehydration, uh, oral dehydration therapy, the use of it, uh, Bangladesh has the highest ORT use rate in the world, not only in the region. And uh, that happened because of the uh, long 10 years arduous work that Bragg did in popularizing and uh, uh, teaching mothers about how to, how to make ORT at home. Uh, uh, so in the 80s, uh, the black workers went from house to house in Bangladesh and taught mothers how to make ORT at home with, with salted sugar. So this sort of uh, changed the whole whole, whole scene uh, uh, in terms of uh, addressing the, uh, uh, the causes of child uh, health, for example. But the, the last two columns are a little different. We haven't been doing uh, uh, quite as good in the other uh, uh, areas such as the skilled attendance at, uh, 
uh, delivery amongst uh, the facility delivery. And we are, uh, uh, our rates are much, much worse than those of India or Pakistan. Uh, this one shows the uh, uh, different mortality rates over time and also the uh, life expectancy as, uh, as if it is here since 1970. As you can see that the life expectancy has consistently improved over the years. The sharpest decline has been, as you can see, the black line uh, in maternal mortality. And uh, 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 the rate which has been quite, quite resistant to change are the neonatal deaths which are given here by, by the green line in the bottom. So we have done very well with respect to some of the uh, indicators of mortality, for example, some of the mortality rates, but not in every, 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 every. Uh, This one shows the total fertility rate uh, and also the contraceptive prevalence rate. This is another area where Bangladesh has done very well. Uh, at the time of independence, Bangladesh had a total fertility rate of 7. But over the years, it has gone down to 2.3 in 2010. And it is said that uh, the, the uh, country may have already reached the uh, uh, replacement level, which is 2.2. <coughs> and uh, this has been possible. Uh, one of the reasons is the increased contraceptive prevalence rate. So in a country like Bangladesh, which is Muslim, a uh, conservative Muslim country, there we have uh, increased our contraceptive prevalence rate to less than 10% in 1970 to nearly 60% now. So which has been, which has been quite, quite dramatic uh, uh, increase in, in percent prevalence. Uh, this one shows the all causes uh, that in a particular area called uh, Matla, which is the uh, 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 field laboratory of the ICD DRB. And uh, the data are over the years between 1987 and 2010. There are two things that you can notice here. One is that the, uh, uh, the deaths due to communicable diseases has gone down quite substantially. It was in 97, uh, about 20%, and now it is about 11% or so. But the major change that you are seeing here is the increase in the proportion of deaths due to non communicable diseases. In 1987, it was about 20%, but now it has uh, gone uh, over. 60%, which is, which is the uh, kind of thing that uh, most of the countries uh, in the developing countries are facing, the, the onslaught of the NCDs, which is part of the uh, epidemiological transition that is happening in, in all those countries. Uh, this one shows the underweight children uh, uh, according to the five wealth uh, quintiles. And there are two things here. One is that, that over time, between 2004 and 2010, uh, there has been gradual reduction in malnutrition. The other thing, which what it shows, is that even among the richest section, richest families, the, the, the malnutrition is a major, major problem. So malnutrition is not essentially only a shortage of food, for example, or resources, but uh, there are a lot of other things that are involved. Uh, this is an interesting graph. Uh, the, the, the blue bars are the uh, Gini coefficient for income, uh, income inequality. And as you can see that, that over time, uh, uh, this Gini coefficient has, has been resisted to any change. So, so the inequality in, 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 in the income hasn't really improved at all, <coughs> as you can see there. So, so, so Bangladesh remains a, a largely inequitable uh, uh, country with respect to income. But if you compare the red line, which is a composite indicator for about six uh, different public health uh, uh, measures, and that shows that over time the, the access to those uh, uh, health services such as family planning, EPI, ORT, uh, uh, the, the uh, access to uh, skilled, uh, 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 skilled care, for example, uh, the the um, uh, concentration index has gone down tremendously, which means that the the uh, uh, inequity in terms of accessing healthcare uh, has been has been has been reduced, 
and both the poor and the richer people have almost the similar kind of access to, uh, to those topical uh, care. Now the question is, why is this positive device? And we feel that uh, these are related to both health-related uh, uh, things as well as this uh, social determinants of health-related. And we feel that that in health development does matter, uh, matter, which is the main sort of uh, 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 thing for this meeting. Uh, so we feel that the the war of liberation had a tremendous impact on. Uh, uh, on the kind of things that we are seeing in Bangladesh. So the war was not only a uh, war for a piece of land, but it was a war for our own culture, it was a war for our own language, and, and, and so on. So this, uh, this has changed uh, the way the, the, the country, the society, looks at development, and particularly the role of women uh, in the society. Uh, there has been a huge lot of uh, national commitment uh, to uh, improve the lives of the poor, for example. If you look at the PRSPs, which PRSP is the Poverty Reduction Strategy Paper, and also the five-year plans, you see that there are a lot of talks about, about uh, equity, about the role of women, about uh, uh, removing poverty, and so on. Although there are, problem, uh, uh, there are issues about how much of these are, are implemented in the real sense, but those are there in the government policy. There has been a lot of pro-health policies which, which were enacted in the country. And, and an uh, 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 important one is the drug policy, which was done in 1982. And that drug policy, which was done by the government, uh, in, 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 uh, with support from some of the NGOs, such as the Kongshaska Kandro, uh, this changed the whole way the, the, the drugs are available in the community. Uh, this, uh, this policy, led to availability of uh, 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 essential drugs at very cheap price. And that's probably one of the reasons why, why, why some of the infections that, that we used to see in the, uh, in the country, we don't see them much. Uh, uh, the reach of the health sector has also improved uh, tremendously over the year. There has been a large number of new uh, health centers built. Although there are questions about the quality of services there, but the but, uh, but facilities are there. Then we have many public health miracles. I, I have talked about family planning, for example. I have talked about our TIDPI. Uh, we have the DOS program, which is for TB. And uh, we have already achieved the WHO target for that, the 70% uh, uh, identification of cases and uh, more than 85% uh, uh, treatment completion rate. And uh, uh, we, if, uh, in terms of water, <coughs> <excuse me. coughs> water, and, uh, water and sanitation, we have also achieved a lot. I mean, one of the uh, indicators of sanitation is what percent of the population uh, defecate openly. And uh, in Bangladesh, it is less than 10 percent, but it is 50 percent in India, for example. So, so those have been done. Then the question of Pluralism in health, uh, Hillary's paper is essentially uh, uh, looking at the pluralism issue, uh, for example. And, the, uh, and then uh, the other thing is the, is the uh, uh, role of the donors. Bangladesh uh, uh, has been very fortunate to, to consistently receive uh, a lot of uh, uh, donor funds. And I think it's, it's one of the few countries where, uh, where, where the, uh, the money has been used quite but well, although there are questions about some of the things which want to go on. Then also there has been a lot of uh, infrastructure built. And uh, uh, for example, uh, particularly I, I want to mention about roads. And uh, as we have seen that, that maternal mortality has reduced tremendously. But, but at the same time, we, we have also seen that we haven't been able to do much about uh, making uh, skill care available. Uh, so so how, how does that happen? I mean, uh, we knew that, we knew that uh, the uh, emergency obstructive care is an essential element for, for any uh, maternal health services. But we haven't seen that in, in, uh, in Bangladesh. But at the same time, we have seen a huge drop in maternal mortality. So there are many hypotheses about that. One is that uh, is related to the uh, huge reduction in fertility. So, so, so all the risk bulks are probably uh, 
about it. And secondly, is, is the availability of roads, the transportation. So all the, although the emergency substrate care is not available in every sub-district, but uh, they are available within one to two hours of uh, 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 road journey, for example. So, so, so people can transport their emergency cases to, uh, uh, to, uh, to those services. Then in terms of food production, over the last 30 years, the food production has doubled, but uh, the population has uh, 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 doubled about the same time, which means that the per capita availability of uh, food has, has increased also quite, quite a lot. Then there are uh, <coughs> things like the access to basic education. As I have said, that, that we have more than 90% of uh, the net enrollment rate. And this was possible because the government and the NGOs have started uh, or, or, or did start uh, some of the affirmative actions, so, uh, things like uh, the, the, the uh, uh, stipend for girls, food for education or cash for education. And also the NGO started schools, which was primarily targeted to, to, to girls and to, children. <coughs> and to children from the poorer families. So all these affirmative actions have actually led to uh, a huge success in, in uh, uh, accessing uh, education. Also, the uh, uh, Bangladesh is a country where uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very prone to natural disasters. You know about flowers and cyclones. So, so just one example. I mean, uh, the, uh, there was a huge cyclone in Bangladesh in 1970, which killed nearly half a million people. But another cyclone, which was in 2007, which was about the same force, but killed only uh, a few hundred people. So there was a huge improvement uh, in the in the in the in the uh, 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 way the the the, uh, uh, the natural disasters are being uh, uh, sort of uh, addressed. So so over the years, the uh, the government and the NGOs have uh, uh, constructed thousands of cyclone shelters in the in the uh, coastal areas which actually saved a uh, huge uh, number of lives. Uh, the flourishing private sector, uh, you know about the uh, ready-made garments, uh, the Rana Plaza tragedy for example, which, which made Bangladesh uh, <coughs> uh, sort of infamous in a way that, that, that we, that so many people, so many people who, most of whom were women died, but, but it's a sector which has contributed and, and is contributing to the economy of the country in, in a huge way. Uh, not only the economy, but also employing uh, uh, the poor people. And most of these four million people who are employed are women. Uh, the government sector uh, uh, sort of uh, contributes about 15% of the total GDP of the country. Then we have the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, which has grown over the years, and uh, uh, Bangladesh is self-sufficient in, in drugs, and Bangladesh also exports to about 70 countries uh, these, these drugs. Uh, the role of women, we feel that that, uh, that is one of the major reasons of, of, of why, why, why why things have changed, and the economic participation of women uh, has increased over the last 30 years from 9 percent to 57 uh, percent. We know that Bangladesh. Uh, uh, Bangladesh has huge microfinance programs uh, where microfinance was born. And there are uh, about 80% of the poor have access to microfinance. And we know that microfinance is not only about improving the, the income of the families, but the kind of impact microfinance has on women's empowerment, particularly, is tremendous. There are, there are a huge number of studies which sort of show that. Then uh, the country has been able to really uh, train thousands of community health workers. All of them are female. Uh, for example, only BRAC has trained and fielded about 105,000 uh, community health workers. All of them are, are female. And they're providing primary health care to the people. And I've already talked about the uh, near universal girls education. The research culture. Uh, Bangladesh has a history of health research. Uh, the research in the country is not done just for research sake. The research there is done to solve a problem. So, so, so when, when there is a problem, research is done uh, 
or actual research is done, find a solution to that. And, and also there is a uh, huge sort of implementation of research finding into programs. And there are many examples. The ORT program of RAC, for example, is a glaring example of how uh, research has been used in improving implementation. Uh, and uh, people are talking about implementation science. Uh, and uh, so, so uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, and Bangladesh is a country where, where the implementation of programs has been done very well. Uh, finally, uh, NGOs in development, the role of the NGOs. And the Bangladesh is known as an NGO country. There are thousands of NGOs in India. And uh, but but uh, the the uh, the good side of it is that uh, the uh, government <coughs> understands uh, that uh, they cannot solve all the problems of the country. Uh, so they have created space for NGOs to flourish, to work. And that's why we are, we are seeing that many of the NGOs are there, like RAC and Grameen and 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 uh, Gomshastro. Uh, uh, who have innovated solutions and then have scaled those up in order to solve uh, problems. Uh, uh, there is a very good sort of uh, relationship between the NGOs and the government. Many of the programs are actually run uh, jointly uh, by the NGOs and the government. One example is the TB program. And the entire uh, DOTS program has been handed over to the NGOs to implement. And government only provides the drugs, which are which are received from the global fund, and also government provides the oversight for. for <coughs> and uh, in this case, I wanted to share uh, uh, the uh, the story of BRAC, which is a uh, there are many NGOs, large NGOs uh, like BRAC. So I, I thought that I would uh, sort of share with you some sort of glimpses from BRAC, which will give an idea of how how uh, uh, sort of a, a, a development organization like like RAC works, and what are the things they are trying to address, for example. So with that, uh, uh, and I want to do that by showing you a short video about RAC. So with these words, uh, thank you very much for your, for your attention, and I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and others. Uh, I'll, we're going to have the video next, are we? Mm -hmm. This is short seven minutes. Bangladesh has been a hotbed of this nation for tackling poverty. RAC, a development organization founded by Sir Fazne Hassan Adil in February 1972, has been a pioneer and a catalyst for change in the struggle against poverty. Today, we're one of the world's largest development organizations, active in around a dozen countries, providing tools that millions use to better their lives. Our microfinance program revolutionized the idea of finance for the poor in the 1970s, when we began working with poor rural women, initially aimed at encouraging self-employment. Our microfinance has widened to include small enterprise development, taking advantage of the multiplier effects of employment generation. For Brad, community ownership is both a principle and a strategy. We formed citizen action groups known in Bengali as Poli Shamaj to strengthen the voices of the poor, creating a platform for rural civil society and government to work together to meet local development challenges. Women in these groups speak with pride about stopping illegal underage marriages through discussion and conflict resolution. Brad pioneered the training of community health workers. In the early 1970s, in Bangladeshi villages where Brad operated, we began working with the Tuashedika, the Bengali word for volunteer or promoter, a local woman who provides door-to-door -door education and services in health, hygiene and family planning, while selling essential health commodities. These community health providers now number more than 100,000 in Bangladesh and work in six other countries. Bragg's interventions on maternal and neonatal health helped Bangladesh halve its maternal mortality rates in the last 20 years. This puts the country on track to achieve the fifth of the UN's Millennium Development Goals. Other health interventions include nutrition, family planning, 
eye care, as well as taking TB and malaria detection and treatment door to door. Bragg is the world's largest private secular education provider with more than 1.1 million students enrolled as of 2012. Our schools offer a second chance to children left behind by formal school systems due to poverty, displacement and discrimination, teaching children to think for themselves at the primary and pre-primary level rather than relying on outdated systems of rote memorization the schools are run with the active support of the communities they serve, with school teachers chosen who want local women who are trained and ensure quality. The success of this alternative schooling model has spread from Bangladesh to six other countries. Operating in Sierra Leone and in Bangladesh, our human rights and legal services program depends on the services of more than 6,000 barefoot lawyers. It is likely the largest NGO-led legal empowerment program in the world. We address issues around sexual harassment, improve gender relations within families, and combat discrimination and violence against women. We provide services to migrants, giving them easy access to services that help them avoid exploitation. Bragg's Ultra Poor program was born from the recognition that certain groups living at the bottom 10 to 15 percent of developing societies are too poor to benefit from market-based solutions like microfinance. The program offers an intensive two-year course of livelihood training and handholding. A greater percentage of these women might feel socially included and get access to formal and informal financial services. Recognizing its success, the ultra-poor program is replicated by other institutions in eight other countries. We have recently launched an integrated development program to serve the most deprived communities who are socially and geographically excluded from mainstream development with a coordinated version of Bragg Health, education, microfinance, and social development programs. Operating in eight countries, our agricultural programs work with governments to ensure food security. We build systems of production, distribution, and marketing of quality seeds at fair prices that bridges the last mile to rural farmers. Our disaster management programs work with communities to improve their response to natural disasters, with weather forecasting systems, disaster resilient housing, and mobile salination plants. We've reached more than 38 million people in Bangladesh through our water, sanitation, and hygiene program, which works to break the cycle of contamination caused by unsafe drinking water, unhygienic latrines, and poor hygiene practices. We renovate and provide communities with new technologies to ensure access to safe water supply and sanitation facilities. While our advocacy campaigns, social marketing, and formative research activities promote good hygiene practices across communities. About half the surplus is generated by our 18 social enterprises help fund the expenditure of our development programs in Bangladesh, while the rest is reinvested in the enterprises themselves. Dividends from BRAC investments support the financial health of the organization and reduce our dependency on donors. BRAC is often its own fiercest critic. Our research division assures the quality of our work, provides evidence and inspires innovations across the organization. People are poor, that parts. Our job as a development organization is to create an in conditions for poor people to move against themselves and be actor in history in changing their own lives and conditions. And I think it is our duty to try and help and focus on other cultures, other people, so that they can learn from that experience and uh, do the right thing for the development of their own country. One man's vision and the efforts of many has turned BRAC into the largest developing organization in the world. Our interventions create an ecosystem in which the poor have the chance to seize control of their own lives. Our work now touches the lives of an estimated 126 million people. We remain true to our vision of a world free from all forms of exploitation and discrimination where everyone has the opportunity to realize their potential.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Beck. It's good to see the, um, the actual reality that you work in. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think Abbas is going to wrap up now with just some concluding comments. I'm back again. Uh, let me conclude the answer, please, by sharing with you the conversion which uh, developed by the, the authors together. In doing so, uh, what they have done, they have identified four major challenges in the health, health sector is facing. I must admit that uh, even if we saw that the contributions perhaps uh, made in the health improvement, would be a lot of it was beyond health sector but the recommendations was focused towards health systems control. The four challenges uh, the identified was shortage of health human resource and the efficient employment. And those of you who are in touch with the Bangladesh health systems, of the healthcare uh, providers, 95% uh, of them are informally trained. Only 5% of the providers are uh, formally trained. So this is a huge challenge. The qualified ones are always concentrated in the other areas, making the rest of the country be tried on quality. High out of pocket healthcare cost, as you saw from the presentation there, of the $27 per quarter income, 65% comes from out of pocket which is a huge burden on the individuals and had an impact on their economic status because of meeting the catastrophic. The medical record system or health information system is chronically inadequate. So they identified it as a focus area. And then the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, which is the, the steering body for the health sector, uh, is a problem in the world. So they made a five point call to action. Uh, I'll not go through the details, I'll just read out the major headlines. Five point of actions. The first one, which is the despair, is to develop a national human resources policy and action plan. The second one was to establish a national health insurance scheme, basically to reduce the out of pocket cost and try to find a mechanism to pool the money for people still spend some healthcare and help. Uh, people to invest in the money as far as for public services by using the concept of health insurance. The, the third one will be health uh, information system or health <coughs> system. With the advent of technology, uh, the authors believe that that's where it should go. And there has to have an uh, integrated health information and the medical record system which will be interoperable. The dream is that whatever a person goes for healthcare, that information can be accessed by the providers uh, whatever they go to the country. In this present, present form, uh, if you go to the public facilities, there is an attempt to record histories, but these are not accessible to the one need. So uh, we also found that this is an area where attention should go. The fourth one is the strengthening of the capacity of Mr. Health and uh, Welfare. Uh, Seems to me the other second man the ministry doesn't have the enough clout to influence the decision making, including as a budgetary equation uh, and also the role of critical decision. And the authors even went uh, to recommend that the government should create a supra ministerial council in health, basically to give more clout to the ministry <coughs> so that critical decisions can be made. Uh, this are the call to actions. But let me mention that uh, we, the team in Bangladesh, we thought that Lancet series should not be one of those publications that uh, is sold in, lab, in the library shelves or on our books. I mean, we should use this for uh, post Lancet advocacy so that uh, the recommendations and other issues can really lead to um, actions which is national So we are using the platform under the New desktop based uh, Bright Institute of Global Health, which also hosts the, the James Peter School of Public Health. 
which is a, a collaborative effort of Iceland and BRAC. And within that center, there is a, a center called Center of Excellence in University of California. We are trying to use this for the advocacy purposes, taking the Lancet series as a tool uh, for discussion uh, among various stakeholders. As of now, uh, we sat down and worked out uh, market segmentation of the stakeholders. We have uh, five broad stakeholders identified, which is non government organizations, media, government, academia, and development partners. And then, though we'll individually, those groups will see it and discuss the Lancet series. And we'll come up with feedback. What can be done? What should be done with what priority? Then that synthesis paper, which in collective work, taking pieces from all the five stakeholders, will be reviewed and further discussed by a small committee, <coughs> which will have to print data from all the uh, five, five segments of stakeholders. Uh, basically, that group will include people who met us in, in the healthcare decision in the country, both in the various sectors I mentioned. And they will prepare an actual plan with clear data timeline, as well as a clear division of labor, or you don't work by one time. And uh, that's what we are uh, moving ahead. Uh, as I said, uh, we are pretty determined that it should not be only the academic piece, all answer series. We would like to see this used as a tool to promote actions, post, we call it post lancet momentum, and get action for the health of the people of this country. Uh, as a first level of activity in the government sector, they only have moved. This is a meeting like three weeks ago, where uh, the Minister of uh, Secretary of Health is sitting in the middle, and he called me in a meeting of expert groups uh, to disseminate and discuss the universal health coverage, what the government can do in this kind of thing. So they have already started to move, and as soon as we get back, perhaps after we pass through the jet lag, we will take this on further and, and try to make the answer series for what it can generate and can uh, impact on the future policies of the country. With this, I conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Andalus. It was a very rich and um, detailed presentation with a lot to think about and that you are then. And I just want to say it's, it's really encouraging to see how a research based publication. Um, can be used in this, you know, really important implementation, policy and implementation way. And we wish you, I think, all the very best with that, with that forward process. I also have a strong hunch that Bangladesh will achieve integrated um, electronic records keeping in their health service long before we manage it in the UK. I think we may have much to learn from you there. Um, thank you. I, I want to move swiftly on because I'd like to leave some time for discussion and I hope the audience can stay. Um, we have some, some short commentaries. I think we'll start with uh, Naomi Hussain. Dr. Naomi Hussain is IDS Research Fellow. She's currently based in Jakarta. Naomi has a long history of working in and on uh, Bangladesh uh, on a number of pertinent issues. And we asked her to, to read the, the uh, Lancet series and give us just some short reflections on um, the kind of paradox that's being explored here. So, uh, over to uh, over to Naomi. <laughs> Hi. I wanted to say first of all how sorry I am that I can't be there um, in person because up us I am that I my first ever boss you know, 20 years ago on the famous Mush the famous Montlock project, and uh, you know it was really inspirational for me uh, working with them both um, in terms of wanting to be in development research and I just. Very exciting uh, launch of the, the Lancet series that I'm sure about. Um, and second, I wanted to say congratulations both to both as for the you know the work, the, the, the contribution that both Bragg and ICDW have made to health programming and of course health research in Bangladesh. Not only in Bangladesh though, also the contribution has been quite at Bangladesh. But specifically, of course, congratulations for this, this special issue. Um, of, of the Lancet, which is a which is a really big achievement, and you know I've been reading recently some of these recent books on the history of the liberation war that have come out, and the, the, the striking contrast between where we were only 40 years ago, with eight million refugees and 
hundreds of thousands of women raped, and then millions of people maimed and injured and killed and famine, infant mortality, maternal mortality rates you know, through the roof. And then to look at now where we are, it is it is a really remarkable achievement when we recall, as Mushak Pai says in his paper, that we were then called the basket case of the world, we were called the test case for development. This 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 special issue to be then to be then presented in one of the leading medical journals in the world as, as a success story, as a case where other countries can learn from us, it really is an important achievement. Um, I, you know, it really is something to be celebrated in many different ways. Um, I wanted to add a few points to this debate, having looked at the Lancet series and having uh, seen what the presentations are supposed to be like. I don't actually know what I'm going to say today, but uh, having seen the papers, I wanted to add a few points to this debate from my position as a Bangladeshi political sociologist and, and feminist. Um, and in general, I really agree with Mushak Pai's points that uh, the liberation war really broke down gender norms in Bangladesh in a way that has been, uh, in many respects, very constructive for gender equality and for social development in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. The fast economic empowerment that we've seen of women in Bangladesh is, is unprecedented. Um, but I wanted to add a note of caution here which is that I strongly suspect, and I know I'm not the only one who thinks of this, that we are reaching the ends of the, we're reaching the limits of the possibilities of women's economic empowerment in Bangladesh. Because while we've been busy encouraging women to go out to work in the garments factories and to start up their own microenterprises and so on, we have been forgetting that actually somebody still has to do the unpaid care work, the work of looking after families and looking after households, feeding people, caring for the elderly and the sick. And this, of course, is very crucial for health. Um, from the work that Simi Mahmoud Mahin Sultan and Suhana Nazneen are doing at the Center for Gender and Social Transformation at Brown University, I think it's very clear that uh, public policy in Bangladesh now really needs to pay much more attention to unpaid care work um, and to support women's unpaid care work in a way that it hasn't in the past. This means encouraging men to do more of their share, it means uh, recognizing the work that women do that's unpaid and generally undervalued by society, but also the state should come in where the state can and help out. But not everything can be tackled through the market, and certainly looking after children and older people is one of those things that can't be, and health outcomes definitely depend very badly on this. So that would be my key thing for me to say, attention to my care care work. Second thing I want to say is that I do think that doctors and nurses get a really hard time in Bangladesh, and uh, you know, I've done some work, a little bit of work on the, looking at the incentives of these, of these categories of stuff, in the, in the public um, uh, healthcare system, and uh, I, I would say that it's actually a very, very difficult job that they try to do. The conditions are really poor in which they work. I remember talking to um, a doctor in um, uh, somewhere in the north, I think it might have been Korea, um, who said that you know, we hadn't trained for six years in order to hand out vitamin pills to malnourished people. He said, these people are not sick, they're just extremely poor. These are one of the problems that we face in Bangladesh. This idea that doc doctors are always absent and nurses are uncaring does seem to forget that their incentives for performing are quite low. Well. There is a kind of unhelpful, I think, sensationalism in not the World Bank type of absentee doctor literature which fails to recognize it. These resources desperately under resourced, these systems, but also the accountability systems are weak. So I think what we need is a very large carrot, but also a very large stick to get doctors and nurses working. The final point I'd like to make is this idea of the Bangladesh paradox, which most of I think is going to discuss. Um, you know, why, why has Bangladesh succeeded in, in its human and social development when, um, when in fact, the governance conditions are so diabolical? Uh, the last nine months in Bangladesh history has been, has just illustrated this so incredibly well, it's, it's quite alarming. And um, politics are deeply dysfunctional in Bangladesh, very violent, very unsettling. Um, particularly when we have political transitions. But, and this has, it has had its impact, I know, in the times for health policy, you know, the separation of the Ministry of Health and Family Planning, for instance, was always a, a, an issue. Um, but actually, the interesting thing, the important thing about Bangladesh, one of the reasons we've succeeded, I strongly suspect, from my own research, has been that there's been a considerable degree of elite consensus, political elite consensus over the main thrust of public policy around social development, around human development, and therefore around health. So that's really created space for NGOs to innovate in the delivery. 
it's created consensus around the need for investments in basic and preventive and public health infrastructure. And it means also that there's really not been much of a paradox when it comes to human development issues and human development policies in Bangladesh. The weakness of governments and dysfunctional politics hasn't really dragged our achievements down. So in key respects, the political elites have been in consensus, and that's been an important aspect of what's going right in Bangladesh, which other countries actually do not always have. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I'm very sad that I'm not there to be part of this really fascinating discussion. Congratulations again. I hope to see you next time. Uh, I don't know if Naomi is uh, looking at the web, uh, at the uh, live stream. I hope she is. If she is, thank you very much, Naomi. That was much appreciated. Um, okay, I'm going to pass quickly on. Um, uh, Jerry Bloom, Research Fellow at IDS, um, uh, is going to, I think, talk particularly uh, about, about some of the health systems uh, and development implications that are coming out of this work. Well, just first to say what pleasure it is to have, have you here uh, and for your presentation. It's in meeting often and that kind of great to meet people. I, I, I want to start by just saying, I remember a conversation I had, oh, it was a couple of years ago. It, it was, well, someone working in an unknown, unnamed donor agency said to me, I was in a meeting, he went with government officials on universal coverage, and we had terrible performance on the statistics on universal coverage and yet better than expected health outcome. Does this mean there's something wrong with the theory of primary health care? So, and that's, that's the paradox. And I guess I had already been working with particularly ICDRB and um, understood quite a bit about what was happening with informal providers and community health workers and said, well, is access so low? Is, 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 is there such a paradox? And I guess I would ask the question, is there a paradox or is public health community just asking the wrong questions? And I, by asking the question, I'm suggesting the latter. They've been asking the wrong questions. And it, in my view, this special issue makes an important contribution because it addresses the right questions um, about the management of health system development, especially in countries that are reconstructing after major social disruption. And so what makes it special? And I guess I wanted to say, first of all, congratulations. I really think this is an important contribution the knowledge. And Richard Hortner here, I would congratulate Lancet for creating a platform for this kind of reflection, which is much beyond the usual research where you evaluate a little intervention and decide whether or not in this particular way it was defined, it has an impact or not. This is a totally different set of questions. So what's special from my point of view about the special issue? Well, I think the first thing is, it's a longitudinal study that explores a major development effort with a 40-year time horizon. Very little work is published by that. And it's written by people who were part of that process and are now reflecting on that process. But it's also not just anecdotes, but it's drawing on evidence. I think this is a very important um, speci special characteristic of this special issue. The second is it illustrates how, oh, a large number of different interventions, national pharmaceutical policy, the emergence and development of NGOs, emphasis on gender inequality, training of large numbers of health workers, somehow all together add up to something that's more than each intervention, but in a way no one expected. So it's about how things add up in development. It goes beyond the usual debates about what's the role of the public and private sector to look at the complex reality of a pluralist system and ask important questions of how do you manage it, rather than trying to make a decision what's good or bad. It has a really useful discussion of the role of research and innovation, because it's not just about um, scaling up a standard um, intervention and then replicating it for the next 30 years. And it's not simply doing research, but it's innovating and taking it to scale. Quite unique. And it raises important questions about the management of change in a complex and rapidly changing context. And I think in terms of all of these things, it's, it's actually quite an important um, contribution to thinking about the problem. And I just want to say, in a world in which many countries are experiencing a wide variety of rapid and interconnected changes with economic growth, urbanization, DACA certainly has that, technological change and the need for new innovations, um, ecological and climate change, we need more research on how to manage these major processes of development and change. Um, and it's important, and I think this is the other point, it's important that national researchers 
who have enough to do in simply trying to solve immediate problems, have a chance to stand back, reflect, learn the lessons, and share them with others. And I think that is the key next step, and I think we need more opportunities for that kind of learning and exchange. And of course, I'm personally particularly pleased that the Future Health Systems Consortium and researchers from three institutions involved could contribute to this. So, congratulations, and I hope that you will be taking forward some of these reflections, both to share with other countries and to deepen them. Research. Um, we are a research institute. Both of our speakers come from institutions which have strong research focus. So our, our last commentator is Dr. Lenny Newport from the Brighton and Sussex. Uh, <laughs> medical School. Uh, and um, Melanie's director of the Welcome Centre for Global Health Research, with a particular interest in um, developing. Um, the, the broader research context from a medical school perspective. So over to you. Mike. Thanks very much. And thanks very much for inviting me to be here. It's a real pleasure and an honour. Again, I want to reiterate the congratulations for this series. Um, it's a real celebration of success. And I don't work in Bangladesh. Uh, and you know, I learned so much reading that series. So what I thought I could bring to this was focusing this on what Jerry's actually made so very nicely from what he said about what others can learn from this. So at the Wellcome Trust Centre for Global Health, Research. Our partners, in fact, my own research institute, has mostly been working with partners in sub saharan African countries where the health statistics are nowhere near as good, very few actually are tracking any of the millennium development goals. So, what we can learn from this is really important. And the first thing I'd just like to stress is why research is so important. And it's really important for countries to understand the epidemiology of their own local diseases and to understand the mechanisms and the determinants of diseases so that they can then go on to develop interventions that are locally relevant, that can then be tested, you know, ideally through clinical trials, and then put into policy. Um, and research that's done in other countries, particularly high-income countries, just isn't relevant often, either because it's they don't have the diseases that are prevalent in low-income countries, or else even if they do, and non-communicable diseases are a very good example here, even if they do have the diseases, still the epidemiology is very different. So it's really important for there to be um, in-country research. So what we've seen today are the examples from Bangladesh. I think a really excellent examples. So and the diarrhea or rehydration solution story, I think, is a really good case study. And I won't go into detail on what actually happened there, but it was a real success story. And the other thing I think that we need to um, acknowledge as being really important to have successful research problems, uh, projects rather, is the importance of committed senior leadership in country. Uh, the development of training programs and infrastructure again in country, and also um, to have strong links between the research that is done and the policy makers, because there's so much research done that never actually gets into practice, which means it was completely pointless doing it in the first place, really. So if we look now outside of Bangladesh, uh, which, as I say, is an excellent example, and, and if you haven't read the series, you can read in more detail in the series, I mean, I think the current challenges for many low-income countries are that the, there is not that commitment in country to research. Uh, so either for resource issues or because of a lack of belief in the importance of research, research just isn't done. And there needs to be a real sort of culture shift, I think, to get this into practice. And that's something that we're trying to work with the countries that we work in um, to actually get this mindset changed. And I think the work that Gail's doing in Ethiopia, actually, around clinical premises, has been a very good example of developing research capacity getting evidence that then informs policy in a very similar way to some of the success stories in um, Bangladesh. And I'd like to say research isn't just the only thing, obviously, because the research does need to be implemented. And the other thing that I think people can learn from the Bangladesh story is the importance of a community health network. And very few low middle income countries are investing in health at the primary care level uh, in, a, in a thorough and um, extensive or uh, comprehensive way. Money's being invested in secondary and tertiary health care, which is expensive and benefits fewer people. So I think that's an important lesson. We focus a lot on the um, gender equality, and that again is really important. And in countries in such a Africa, we know that actually, if you give the women the education, give the women the money, their health indicators are better. But this needs to be much more formalised. The, the, the place of women in society needs to be 
um, in feet, I think. But the other thing that really struck me about this series was about persistence and resilience. These things don't happen overnight. The song that we did, the black story getting from having a diarrhea problem to treatment that's in practice. It's, it's, um, there were lots of hurdles to overcome, lots of um, going back and reiterating things. And the resilience in the context of either the liberation war or natural disasters, cyclones and flooding. I think that is something actually also that people can learn from. So that's all I'm going to say, so we have time to open it up to a more wider discussion. But thanks again for a wonderful series, and enjoy your talks, and thanks for having the opportunity to participate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie, and I think you appreciated your last point um, about the, in a sense, the, yes, the, the persistence and resilience of what I think is really, is really it's critical. Hard. It's hard work, it's hard work, and it doesn't always fit into the time scales of funders and governments and so on. It's not a two year fix. Thank you. Okay, our, our speakers are back. I'm going to now, um, you've been a very patient audience, thank you, um, to invite any comments, questions from the floor, and also if, there are, if anybody's um, um, tweeting in or, or uh, asking questions who, uh, from, the, uh, from the live stream. Yes. Yes, there's a microphone. Uh, Could you just say uh, who you are, please? Yeah, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Amol. I'm a student at the IBS. I'm doing game development studies. I'm from Bangladesh. I just want to ask you a question. Um, does it come to say I'm a Bangladeshi husband and wife to prefer a uh, boy instead of girls? They see that as their heir or whatever reasons. So I just want to ask whether the nutritional status among girls and boys are same or there, there is a strong difference? And what is the expenditure that families spend on their girls and boys? Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, a very interesting question. Uh, yeah, uh, if you go to the 70s and 80s, the gender differentials in health status were well, usually in favor of whites and all the best experts. And remember in a serious study where we had the number of suburban data and we saw that over the years girls adapted much better than boys. They spent much worse for the other passes rate of coming in this country. Then we went on a study and we took a very in-depth study of the Newcomb family. And we found that uh, there had been a serious discrimination against uh, food education against girls. And then when it comes to involving cash, like medical care and other things, the girls suffer most. Then the number to think about the company and the company was. And then the other interesting pattern was that uh, during the first five months of life, when uh, children are becoming baby that depend on mother's breast, uh, the girls suffer much better than mothers. As soon as the belly and the children are taken out of breast and they have to depend on extra food in the family, they got in the cycle of infection, sickness, and this kind of thing. With the pattern of survival, it can just go down. The boys survive better than the girls in this kind of It has improved a lot, as it is reflected in the life expectancy of much of the same. And uh, even in the childhood, uh, it is almost visible. Uh, in terms of nutrition status, I think the girls have seen slightly more than the boys. Uh, in terms of uh, Sex preference of children? I mean, yes, there is a preference uh, in both South Asia. I mean, this was lucky that it doesn't have uh, symmetry of ocean when they both have us in India. India is a much less. So, uh, so, yeah. But the other good thing is in Bangladesh is that even if there is a sex preference, uh, parents won't go more than three to fulfill their sex preference. They'll stop at three hundred and seven. This kind of thing. All these all these positive indications are here in reducing the discrimination of the class. Uh education in the programs and I think. Uh just just what the boss was saying is in the with uh about his son preference for example. And it's not only as the boss was saying South Asia, but also if you look at China, even Vietnam for example. These uh uh, sex-based abortions. Uh, abortion had to write in the, in the uh, 
what, what, uh, what are the missing 50 million uh, guards in the body. So, so this is there, of course, and, and it's, it's going to take a long time to really uh, do anything about that, I suppose. But, but uh, it, it, uh, uh, Naomi, uh, who, who just spoke, uh, she was involved, uh, she was talking about the Maklop research that uh, Dragon ICD that he did uh, uh, in the 90s and uh, early 2000s. And she was, I think she was part of that research, uh, which tried to look at the, the impact of, of drag programs, which is microfinance and education, on uh, the, the intra-family allocation of food, which was found to be a major problem uh, by Lincoln Chan and others. And uh, what, what they found was that, that uh, because of the drag programs, uh, there was a change. And the change was more in terms of the uh, amount of food that is given. So, so the boys and girls were given the same amount of food. But when it comes to the quality of food, uh, it was always the boys who received the ad of the, of the, of the fish. Because the fish is very exotic in Bangladesh. So, so when it comes to that, uh, the girls are not given the ad of the fish. It's, it's the boys who uh, were given the uh, ad of the fish. So that's one example, of it, which which means that that we have to go a long way in order to address that. That's that's, that's another example on that is the, the track school. Uh, as I said, that track schools are for guard sector. Seventy percent of the uh, 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 kids going to track schools are guards, and we uh, really do uh, through a kind of a affirmative action. Uh, and but 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 what we have seen is that uh, that uh, uh, when you closely observe it, they teach it how she behaves in the class. Uh, you see that when she asks a question, she always asks the boy for the girls. So, so those kind of things are in our, uh, uh, I don't know what to call it, this societal uh, uh, way of looking at things. Uh, but it's changing, but it's, it's, it's a very slow process. Uh, so, very much. There's lots of hands going up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think who's next? I think, uh, yes, uh, there's two in the row there, and then two in the row here. So let's take those in order. Two, two at the back first. My name is Naime Salima. I'm um, doing um, an MA in gender development. I come from Malawi, which is in the sub Saharan um, region. And my question is on um, sustainability. Uh, what is it that BRAC has done differently to the extent that it has managed to sustain the gains made in development and in education? I'm asking this coming from a background where, um, you know, donor agencies or organizations have implemented a program in Malawi, but after they, they phase out, then the results are also, you know, somehow washed away. What is it that we've done differently? that has managed to sustain um, the gains that we've made. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take uh, uh, a bunch of questions and then ask the others and we'll try to reply together. So, yes, the next question. My name is Precious Simba and I'm doing MA Gender from Zimbabwe. And um, I want to ask a question that um, Naomi raised a little bit in our video, which is, it seemed to me throughout the presentations and the video, that some of these gains are riding on gender inequalities. Like most of the volunteers, and that's volunteers in quotes, are women. And we find that much of the success, the economic success coming from the government factory has ridden on um, low paid jobs that are given to largely women. So my question is on going forward, how do we make these programs more gender equitable? and reduce the drudgery that they put on women. And how do we also how can we also reduce the way that women are essentialized in our programs? Thank you. Uh, and then two on this row. Yes, yeah, so Thanks. Gail Davy from the medical school. Uh, this is a question for Mushta I was very interested by your comment that medical women had created space for NGOs. And I just wonder a little bit further in describing that. Was that at all delineated? Were there, were there any limits in terms of where NGOs could work? I'm thinking of some countries where there are strong restrictions on areas in which NGOs could work. 
Hello, I'm Maya Munihan. I'm an anthropologist um, working in the Indian Child Health Institute in India. And um, I have two several questions that I have to stick to two. One is I'm really interested in the in in um, you mentioned about the plural the, the management of pluralism within healthcare. And um, I we didn't really say anything about it. I know that's really going to be your uh, paper, but I'd be really interested to hear about that, and also why, for instance, um, in terms of uh, midwifery and in terms of delivery services, um, they, you know, you weren't able to achieve um, what you set out to achieve. Um, at, at that point. Thank you very much, Mark. I think uh, let, I'm going to ask um, other instructors and to focus so far. <laughs> Yes, we have you wanted to buy the last separate. Yes, I mean, this is a problem specifically for you, I think. Uh, well, I want the question of sustainability of drag, for example. It, it all depends on how we define sustainability. Uh, uh, so, 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 sustainability of programs, uh, so, for example, program like the ORT program, it is just once, once you give the uh, knowledge, uh, it sustains. And uh, we, we did that program in, in the 80s. And there were studies done in uh, uh, in the 90s, for example. Uh, uh, and uh, to the, the, uh, uh, you know the study on basic education, uh, uh, to, to, to some of the uh, which, which also collected information on some of the life skills. And the, one of the life skills uh, question was that uh, whether 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 in, uh, whether the child knows uh, 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 what is the treatment for diarrhea. So, 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 in 1995, uh, about, about 10,000 children aged 11 and 12 were asked this question, uh, what is the treatment for diarrhea? And uh, uh, to our surprise, we found that uh, over 70% of the, of, the, of, the child, of the children who were asked that said ORT or global food or salt and sugar. Interestingly, I mean, these children uh, were not even born when their mothers were uh, uh, taught about that. So, which shows that that uh, this has now become a part of the culture. So, this is sustainability in a way. So, that's that's how one can look at sustainability. But but then there are uh, questions about the financial sustainability. And uh, 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 drag is dependent on donors for about 30 percent of all our expenditures. The rest 70 percent come from our own sources. Uh, so, we have uh, I mean from from day one, for example, I've been thinking that how do we reduce our dependence on donors. And through, for that we have created enterprises, for example. Uh, but the, uh, the enterprises are not for business sake, not to make money, but to help some of the programs. So we, uh, one of the principles that we have is to create those value chains or the backward and forward linkages uh, for economic development. And in order to do that, you need to have, uh, for example, some of the enterprises. So, uh, just to give an example, we have been giving loans for uh, 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 for rearing cows, and and we found that the uh, 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 the borrowers were not finding a good price for their milk uh, because uh, they had to sell in the local market, and, 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 and there was some situation as well. So we thought that it's very important to, 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 to connect these growers with the market, and that's why we set up a. Uh, a milk plant, a dairy plant. So, so, so we, we now collect milk from all over the country uh, through through the, uh, those uh, cool, uh, cooling trucks, and then bring to a to a central place where we uh, process them and then market them in the big cities. Uh, so, so through that, the the growers get more and more sort of uh, price, and also break, uh, also make some money, uh, sort of uh, surpluses, which helps to. Uh, support our other programs. So, so, so that's how we are trying to sort of sustain, for example. So that's, that's one, that, uh, that, that was one question. Uh, about the uh, creation of space for uh, uh, the government. Uh, well, I mean, I'm uh, one of uh, let me put it this way, I mean, in, uh, after, the, after the independence, so the government uh, in power, for example, was patriotic government, and uh, they wanted to do things which is good for the people. But they also knew that they cannot do it themselves because they didn't either they didn't have the uh, human resources or also the 
uh, uh, financing for that. So, so, so they uh, sort of uh, uh, invited the NGOs whether they can help to implement those programs. And uh, in order to do that, they allowed the NGOs to, to, to come and work with the government. So, uh, so, so uh, unlike other countries where, 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 where the government don't really patronize even the NGOs, uh, that the NGOs can have a role in development. But the, uh, the, uh, the government in Bangladesh, they have sort of recognized that. And uh, uh, they work very closely with the government. Uh, although, I, I mean, you can see that when, when, when uh, you think about the relationship between the government and NGOs, there is some kind of a love and hate relationship there. But, but, but it is more on the, on the love side <laughs> that, that, that uh, they receive in Bangladesh. Much to add, uh, to complement the relationship between the NGOs and the government. That, uh, even during this couple uh, of hours, uh, we have questioned that whether there is an inherent weakness of the state that the NGOs could have achieved that choice. So we back to the fact that the realization that the government, that the need is used, and the public sector alone cannot effectively open the space. So that is not weakness. That was in our opinion so we of the government. So that the Bangladesh history tells that there can be a very strong confidence for the government organization. And now I can use a lot of programs that they can talk about the methods of making the location. There is a question on just like what it is. What are the questions that you repeat in the past? Yes, I think, I, think, I think the question was, are the gains riding on gender inequalities? <coughs> rather than, um, I think the presentation suggested that um, in the sense gender inequalities have been reduced by women going into the government industry, by women becoming community based health workers, and so on. And I guess I think the question that was raising but is that. Uh, in a sense, also reinforcing gender inequalities in, in certain ways. Well, it, it might actually uh, be seen as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a reinforcing in some areas, but but we believe that that's only transition. Uh, uh, that that that, that it, it might, but, but but in the long run, uh, it will be the women who will be benefited by that. And and uh, so, for example, I mean, in the government sector, we have about one million workers. Uh, who come from the rural areas, and almost all, uh, about 80% of them are female. Uh, and uh, uh, we know of many kind of ill treatment that is being written up to them. But, uh, and also we, we know of the Rana Plaza kind of uh, uh, prejudice that are, uh, that are happening. But, but, but uh, uh, we, we are also seeing the changes in the, the way the, uh, the country, the government and the, and the buyers, for example, are actually uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 trying to address that. So, so for example, after the Rana Plaza, what has happened is that the, the, the wages has actually almost doubled because, the, uh, because there was a huge pressure on the government as well as on the Governments and manufacturers to, to change the uh, uh, the condition in which the the, the workers live. So 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 I mean uh, 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 these strategies are also leading to changes which are which are beneficial for the women. For example. But but uh, these are as I said earlier, I mean, there are slow changes, uh, but 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 are happening. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, I guess in our paper, pluralism refers to the, um, the way in which the health system in Bangladesh um, actually consists of a multiplicity of different actors um, who have very different relationships to the state. Some of them are part of the state health system. Uh, most of them are, if you like, independent actors who historically 
come about. Maybe there's been a training course in the past that the government has put on and they've become a, a local village doctor. Um, there are many, many informal ways in which people gain medical uh, and health training in Bangladesh. And I think talking about pluralism, um, uh, in a sense, is an acknowledgement of the fact that um, the public health paradigm is that on paper, the health system looks like um, there's a government structure and in every village or whatever or town, you know, there's a network of primary health care facilities and their government health workers and their impost and their and their working uh, locally and so on. But actually the reality is that um, that's only partly what is happening and that much of the health care is provided by actors who are not part of that form of government system. And it's a recognition that um, I think you might just think it is estimated as over 80% of the first encounters of a person with, with the health system are not with a government health worker. They're with this multiplicity of other actors, village doctors, local healers, um, somebody who's had some NGO training and has set up as a local health worker and so on. And particularly to um, local drug vendors and you know, small shops that supply um, uh, cheap uh, medicines and so on. Um, and I think the issue we were raising in the paper is recognizing the reality of that in a context where there's a severe resource constraint, where it would take many years to train you know, and develop um, cadres of health workers um, in order to fill that gap. Which is, so how do you manage a system like that? You know, what, how, what do you do? How do you work towards a kind of government, government sort of system, which has an in, which is multiple centers, if you like. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not our fantasy of what our system is like, it's <coughs> the reality of what our system is like. Yes. <coughs> uh, yes. Times <laughs> um, People still get Does anybody else want to give me quick last questions? <laughs> There is, a, yes, at the back. Just quick, just very briefly. Hello, everybody. My name is also Abbas Mitsubishi, and uh, thanks a lot for the presentations. Um, I just want to ask you about um, uh, your reference to Supramit Ministerial Council on Health that you proposed in the call of action. Uh, could you elaborate on what we mean by that and the rationale for that, please? This was a new idea. Uh, basically, to create a body which will help the health ministry, which is very nearly weaker in the opinion of the it, it should be a, I mean, the, the ideal uh, scenario was that it should be a committee of the ministry, but a direct link to the Prime Minister of the Red Power. So that that committee of the ministry to achieve what the sector should decide on what to do. I don't think the ideas of the crystallized that matter there, how it should be treated with them. We hope that the post lancet monitor, the advocacy we have done that, will thrash out those ideas far more in detail. And perhaps if we keep our own Bangladesh, uh, in six, something, in six months' time, whether it's accepted or rejected, or I'm sorry, but I can be much more specific. Yeah, that. Um, um, one, one is obviously, I mean, if you want to do a, you exceed the you need more money. So, so, so in order to do that, you have to have the Minister of Finance in your in your private So, so you need to speak to the Minister of Finance. So, so if you bring them under under uh, under the uh, super body, then it will be much easier. Uh, similarly, you also know that uh, health is not always about healthcare. The changes that happen in health, well, only about half of that is 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 sort of uh, explained by uh, healthcare system. The rest happens in somewhere else. The, 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 the social determinants of health. So, so we need to bring in other actors, the other ministries, in order to solve the health problem. So we thought that having that super ministry uh, can help us to clearly take that problem. Thank you very much. I, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for staying. Um, I think we, we, we're well over time, and I think you know, it's a testament to how interesting the, um, the, the conversation and the presentations have been. Um, I'd like to warmly, warmly again thank Mr. Blackburn for being here, giving us these presentations, this opportunity to 
have this debate. We look forward to continuing our relationship with, with, with them and their institutions in the future. They always will have a warm welcome with the as they know. I'd like to thank our other uh, speakers, Melanie, Jerry, and Naomi, if she's at that somewhere <laughs> online, and our questioners. And, and thank you all of you for coming. And let's give it a Uh, again, so, but, but, great. Yeah. Yeah. Website and, um, in many places. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.